church family, so good to join you online this morning. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your flexibility. And thank you for continuing the vision of the Avenue Church. We strive to empower people to take their next step towards Christ. And even in the midst of this chaos, we invite you uh, to put away distractions and allow God to draw you closer to himself. We believe here at the Avenue that even in the midst of what's going on around us, that God wants to be near, that God uh, has a plan and a purpose for his church. And so we're uh, just excited to join you today, um, wherever you're at, wherever you're, you're watching from. We want you to just put away the next hour to get rid of the distractions and to draw your attention to what God wants to do in your life and through your life. And once again, thank you for your flexibility. Uh, this has been a new week, a, a totally new experience uh, for church online, and our team has done a great job of putting together resources, putting together videos to stay connected. And so once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of what God is trying to do through his church in the midst of this time. Uh, we're going to sing a few songs together. We're going to hear an encouraging word from our pastor. And we're just uh, thankful for the opportunity to, to still have worship together. Even though we're scattered, God still has a plan and a purpose for us. And so thank you for joining us. We're going to sing a few songs together. Won't you participate with us?
Welcome to church today. We're so glad to have you joining us, even though you can't join us in person. For those of you familiar with the Avenue, each time in our worship service, we have a time of offering. We believe that's an act of worship because we want to be known for the generosity that we show to others. Because of the generosity of those that call the Avenue home, we were prepared 
to be able to go online and to be able to continue church, we are also prepared to provide resources for you and your family. Because of that generosity, we've decided that all of our people that depend on us, such as custodial crew, some of our care team, those that work part-time that really depend on a paycheck, even though they're not working during this time, we're still going to continue to pay them. We can't do that without your generosity. And so we want to thank you in advance for continuing to trust God in your finances. And for those of you that maybe you wait to come to church and you put it in the bucket or you drop it uh, on the way out, we'd encourage you to get online and go to our app or to just go to our online website and give digitally. And if you really aren't comfortable with that, you can just mail a check to the church at 210 YMCA Drive. We want to encourage this because we are going to continue to do ministry. And we believe in the days ahead, we'll be even more needed to take care of our community. Because we love our community, we want to continue to do everything we can to help them. But once again, we need your generosity. I hope during this time, you will trust God in all things, but for the church's sake and our ministry's sake in the area of finance. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you and we trust you. We know that you are the provider, that you are our resource. And God, as we continue to be generous, as we continue to serve our community, Father, we just pray that you will bless those efforts. God, that you'll continue to show us how faithful you are when we seek you first. All things work together, and that so much applies to our finances. Thank you, Father, for a generous church. Thank you for a generous people. God, we look forward to seeing the good in people through this difficult time. Thank you, in Jesus' name.
give us vision to see things like you do. God, we look to you. You where our help comes from. Give us wisdom. You know just what to do. God, let that be our sincere desire and request today. That we would trust in you like never before. That we would lean on your wisdom, your vision, your understanding that far surpasses ours, Lord. We pray that over each and every home, every city, every nation all across the world because we trust that you are good and that Jesus reigns above all. And open up our hearts to hear your word. We ask that in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. so much for joining us online, and I know online is not the same, but online has some advantages. First of all, we got to put our two praise bands together from both campuses, and that's a lot of fun. You get to hear both of them, whether you go to the Ennis campus or the Waxahachie campus. And then also, for the first time in the last 15 years, no one has complained to me about how loud the music was. So that's a good thing. You get to control the volume at home, and if you like it loud, it, that, that's been great. It's wonderful. So glad that you can do that. Now, I make jokes because that's what I do. Even in a crisis, I, I make jokes. But I do understand that we miss being together as a church family. It's not the same to worship without everybody in the room. It's not the same to preach without everybody in the room. Everything is different, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad. God has used times like this in church throughout the centuries to make the church stronger, to make our witness stronger, and to let people know the love of God. It's really reminding the world that God is in control and we are not. We are dependent on him. And so through this time, we're going to be the church. We've taught forever that the church is not the building. It's the people. And so we're going to go back to an ancient way of worship where families gather together and the family worshiped together just in the family unit. And they become deeper. They knew each other better. They got to know God at a deeper level. And they learned to trust him. And that's what we're going to encourage you to do. Our staff has been working hard. It is so exciting that we can give you all of these resources online. That we can do daily devotionals. That we can have online church. So you can still experience worship. If you're not getting the full effect of worship... Uh, I encourage you to gather your family in the bathroom, turn on the steam so you have haze, and then shine a laser light in each other's eyes. And that way you have more of the full experience of what we do here at the Avenue Church. Once again, I make jokes. I told you, that's what I do. It's very uncomfortable. Now, the problem, nobody laughs, but that's most of my jokes anyway, so that's not even causing me a problem. Let's get to what we want to talk about today. We are in a series called Horrible Bosses. We've been in this series for a while, and, and a, a good subtitle is How to Say No to the Emotions that Control You. And so we've been going through this for the past several weeks. We've talked about guilt and anger. Today, we're talking about fear. And I can't think of a better topic to come in line in our sermons than discussing how to not let fear control us. How to not let that fear 
get into us and affect the things that we say and the things that we do. Jesus tells us, and he's very clear, he says he called the crowd to them, and he says, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. And so when we let emotions take control of us, we have all of these emotions in us and it throws us off balance. We end up saying things that we regret and we always say, well, I didn't mean to say that. Well, actually, you did mean to say that because that's in your heart and that's what Jesus is talking about. These things that are in your heart come out whenever you let emotions control you. In a time of fear, you're gonna say things to people, you're gonna say things to your family that are hurtful. And Jesus is very concerned about those relationships. In fact, he's concerned about our hearts. He says it this way, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. In other words, he's trying to explain to us that religious practices and if we don't read the Bible that morning, that's not what defiles us. It's what comes out of our mouth because what comes out of our mouth hurts others. And Jesus is real clear that we have to guard our heart because our heart is evil. And we all see that. We all know that. And all of us, there's been some evil thoughts. There's been some angry thoughts. There's been some fearful thoughts. All of us have that in our hearts. So... Proverbs tells us what to do. It says, above all else, guard your heart and everything you do flows from it. Now, we're real good at our behavior modifying it. We're real good at, at hiding the things inside of us. But God says, I want to do something more. I don't want you just to modify your behavior. I want you to change your heart. So how do we guard our hearts? First of all, we need to get the toxins out and we need to keep them out. As we talk about fear, all of us know that fear will rob you. Fear will rob you. It robs your family. It robs your marriage. It robs your parenting. It robs your sleep. If we, active, if we live in fear, we do things that we normally wouldn't do. We have a situation, if we revolve ourselves around fear, that all of a sudden we're fighting over toilet paper. Why would we do that? Humans have survived for centuries without it, but all of a sudden... That's the most important thing, and, and people are literally fighting over it, and that's based in fear, and that fear comes from our heart, and it disrupts all of our relationships, and so we have got to do everything we can to not let it wreck our lives. Now, all of us have used fear in parenting at one time or another, right? It's not always necessarily bad to have fear. All of us have used it when we try to parent our kids, and I get that, and fear is a pro byproduct of understanding there are some things in our life that can hurt us, and that's fine. We pass that on after generation, generation. My father taught me to be afraid of snakes. Uh, I don't think I would have been afraid of snakes, except he was deathly afraid of snakes, and when I watched him have fear, he passed that on to me. Some fear's good. I don't want anything to do with snakes today. Why? My father didn't have anything to do with the snakes. Probably had an ancestor somewhere down the line that got bit by a snake. I don't know. I haven't been bit by a snake. So fear's not bad if it's under control. But it's when fear grabs a hold of us and all of our responses come out of fear. When we sit in our homes during this time and we're so afraid that we're going to catch this virus, we're so afraid that we're not going to have enough, we're so afraid that life's not going to be back to normal. It's off balance. So how do we get that balance? Jesus gave us how to deal with fear. But now the problem when you read the Bible so many times is we look at what Jesus said about fear and we take it out of context. We just see each of the stories as an isolated story. But you gotta remember, Jesus spent three years with his disciples. He spent three years with a group of men we call apostles who were called to walk beside him, who lived with him, who worked with him. He poured everything into these 12 men and he was teaching them how to live life after he was not there how to live life after and carry on this message of hope. And this is what he said about fear. He just simply said, fear not. Fear not. Now, taking out of context that Jesus is teaching them all through this three years what that looks like, when he says just fear not, that doesn't make sense to us. It didn't make a lot of sense to the apostles, to be honest with you. Because he put it like this. He said, I'm going to send you out like sheep among wolves. 
I'm going to send you out like sheep, um, sheep among wolves. Now, for us, that's just a line. But for them, they had seen what happens when sheep are out among wolves. It's not a pretty sight. There's not much left. And so he's telling them, I'm going to send you out, and you're going to get tore up. You're going to get imprisoned. You're going to get beaten. And they're like, but he says, but don't be afraid. Fear not. Well, how do you do that? How can you not be afraid after he's told you what's about to happen? When we look at our lives and there's fear, and then Jesus goes, oh, fear not. You have to see the whole story. And I want to take you through this field trip that he took the apostles through to show them why not to fear. And so I want you to join me as Jesus took this pilgrimage, as he walked his disciples through this understanding. He says in Matthew 8, 23, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And so here's what Jesus did. He just told him, I'm going to send you out. They're going to tear you up. You're going to be imprisoned and beaten. Don't be afraid. Because guys, come on. Let's get in the boat. So they get in the boat. Now remember, these boats that were on the Sea of Galilee, they're not yachts. They were small boats. They had very small sides. And you got 13, 14 people in this boat. And you're going across the Sea of Galilee. Now, at the Sea of Galilee, I've been on that sea about seven or eight times. It's incredible. It's a beautiful sight. But they tell me, I haven't seen it yet, and I actually hope to see it one day, that a storm can come through this valley, and all of a sudden, the water, the waves can be five, six feet tall, and these small boats can be in danger of sinking quickly. And so that's the kind of storm that came up while they were rowing across that sea, and Jesus was sleeping. Now, he wasn't down in a cabin sleeping. He was out there, right there in the midst of all the things going on, the wind, the rain, the waves breaking over the boat, and he was asleep. Now, these men had been on this sea their entire life. Many of them were fishermen. They earned their, their job. Their job was related to this sea. But all of a sudden, the rain is pouring down. And you've been in that situation before, right, where you're out in the rain, and it's just beating down on you, and thunder and lightning, you can't hear, you're soaked, you're miserable. Well, that's what these men were going through. They were soaked, they were miserable, they were having to scream at one another so they could be understood, and the water's coming over the wave, they're trying to bail it out as quick as they can, they think they're about to drown, and this fear that Jesus had just talked about, they were experiencing at that very moment. They were afraid. So they go to Jesus, now, they've got to be a little aggravated that he's asleep, right? What in the world, how is he sleeping through this? He's soaking wet, water's beating down on him, he's asleep, it's like, hey, wake up! What? Wake up! And Jesus stands and looks at him. He says, you have little faith. They're like, what'd you say? You have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. And it was completely calm. Completely calm. They went from fearing for their life to a perfectly calm day. The men were amazed. And they asked this question among themselves. What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obeying. I want you to notice Jesus was in that storm, but he didn't panic. Jesus was in that storm. The waves were hitting him. He was soaking wet just like they were. He saw the same circumstances, but he didn't panic. He wanted his apostles to see that he didn't panic. God doesn't panic. Just because we're in the middle of a pandemic doesn't mean that God is panicked. And the disciples needed to see that God doesn't panic in these situations. Maybe you and I need to see that God doesn't panic. With that, what kind of man is this? Peter told Mark, Mark wrote it down years later. He said, we feared a great fear. See, all of a sudden, they weren't afraid of a storm. They were afraid of Jesus. They were afraid of the power that he had. They were in fear. They couldn't get away. They're, it's a small boat. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves? Who is this man that's more powerful than this storm? Who is this man that's more overwhelming than this storm? Who is this man that's more powerful than the virus? Jesus. We fear him. 
Jesus goes on and he begins to teach. He says, listen, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Don't be afraid of the circumstances around you. Don't be afraid of the virus that is scaring us to death. Don't be afraid of the economic collapse. Don't be afraid of those things. Those things can take your body. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have a bigger fear? Fear me, he says. Fear God. He's got it all under control. He's above all of it. He's more overpowering than anything you're facing. And then he says this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And you and I read that and we're like, well, I don't know, are they? Who knows? But this was common for them. They knew exactly a sparrow wasn't worth much. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Then he goes on and says, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He knows the number of hairs on each person's head. Now for me, that changes daily. But he knows that. And, and Jesus is trying to explain, listen, listen, listen. He knows when a sparrow that is worthless pretty much falls to the ground. He knows you. He knows you personally. So don't be afraid. You're worth so much more. You're worth so much more than many sparrows. God is a personal God. He knows your name. He knows what you're going through, and he cares. Even when bad things are happening and your prayers are going unanswered, God is there, and he's in control. He knows everything you're going through, everything. The field trip goes on because, you know, they're like us. And they're not going to get it just with one illustration. So the field trip goes on. You see a couple days later, Jesus is standing teaching. And remember, these crowds have gathered around him. Everybody wants to be around Jesus. And they're pushing him back, and he's teaching, and he's teaching. And it's getting late. And it's getting so late, people are starting to get hungry. And so these same apostles that he's trying to teach to fear not come up to him. And they're like, hey, you need to send these people home. They need to go get something to eat. Jesus says, well, you feed them. They're like, What? What do you mean? There's not enough food in this entire area to feed this crowd. Jesus says, you feed them. So that's when they find that fish sandwich, and Jesus prays over it. And he hands it to the disciples. And you see, the multiplication was done when he handed it to the disciples. They went out and began to break it and kept having more and more and more. And they were overwhelmed watching this. They saw that God was in control. So Jesus was ready to give him another illustration, he says, hey, come on, guys, let's get in the boat. They're like, no, I don't think so. In fact, the verse in 14, says, immediately after that, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. And that Greek word is, he forced them into the boat. Man, I can understand that. I'd be like, nah, I'll walk. I'm all right. But he forced them into the boat. As he forced them into the boat, they went on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So he dismisses the crowd and sends them off. And they're going to meet on the other side. And they start rowing. It starts to get dark. And all of a sudden the wind comes against them and they start rowing against the wind. And they're rowing against, that's a song. Anyway, they're rowing against the wind and they're not getting anywhere. And so for hours they're rowing and they're rowing and they're rowing and they're trying to get across this water. And that's aggravating and I'm sure they're afraid again. And then all of a sudden... It says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. We don't want fear to be our boss. Nobody wants to live in fear. Nobody wants to be afraid. And when fear monopolizes our heart, it comes out and it shows itself and it becomes the boss of us, then we tend to do things and say things that hurt others. Jesus is concerned. He wants us to understand, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Take courage. Now, of course, they still didn't understand. 
In fact, the last week that Jesus walked on the earth, they came into Jerusalem. And I wish you could understand how excited the apostles were. They thought this was it. Everything we've been building to, this is it. It's about to happen. He's about to set up his kingdom. Rome is about to be sent away. And all of a sudden, he is going to be in charge. And we're going to be right here by him. And so they come in excited. But as you know, the Easter story, it took a tragic turn for them. Because Jesus says, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and rulers. And they're going to crucify me. Now, they didn't hear the part about coming back because who would have heard that? Would you believe that? No, we wouldn't believe that. So all of a sudden, Jesus was taken out. He was put on a cross. When they came to arrest him, he had told them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He had showed them that he is in control no matter what the circumstance. But what do you think the disciples did? They ran. They ran and they hid. Until all of a sudden on the third day, they saw Jesus again. See, then it all made sense. All of Jesus' teaching came back to them when he's resurrected. Because then it makes sense. That's the point of all of this. He's trying to explain to them that I have conquered fear. I have conquered death. I have conquered the grave. You have nothing to fear. Listen. These very men became bold. They came out of hiding, and they began proclaiming the word of God. And just like Jesus said, they were persecuted, they were arrested, and most of them were put to death. But they weren't afraid. See, when you don't fear death, there's not a lot of things that can shake you. The resurrection made that point. Fear not, I am with you. They came out of hiding. When we lose our faith of fear... Now, what does that mean for us? We have to be the church like we've never been. We haven't stopped assembling together out of fear. We've done it out of respect for our community, respect for authority, and we've done it out of love for our neighbor. Churches throughout history have come out stronger because of things like this, and I think we will too. I think we're going to come out stronger. We're going to see people gathering around each other and being the church because our staff, we can't be the church. You have to do it. So what does that mean to not fear? That means when your neighbor needs you, you're not afraid. When your neighbor needs something, you're not afraid. When the church asks you to keep tithing, you're not afraid. Now, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you go around licking doorknobs because you're not afraid. That's not what it's about. It's not about doing stupid things and showing everybody you're not afraid because you're going to keep eating out and you're going to keep doing all the things they've asked us not to. That's not Christianity. Christianity is we're not afraid to serve God. We're not just stupid. We're not afraid to serve. So when your neighbor needs something, reach out. And if everything they say is correct... There's going to be a lot of people that are sick. So what does the church do? We take care of them. There's going to be a lot of people out of a job. So what does the church do? We take care of them. There's going to be a lot of people seeking answers. And now's our time to show them the difference that Jesus makes in our life. He said, fear not. He's in control. He's got this. God, I hope that encourages you. It encourages me. I mean, there's times that I can look inside and start getting scared and start wondering. And I'm almost in that critical age. And I'm thinking, oh, who are we going to lose in the church? And I have to remember, God, you're in control. You're in charge. Help us be the church. Now, our staff, I want to thank them. They have worked this week. Oh, my gosh, they've worked so hard. And they have done the impossible for you. Now, we need you to be the church. We need you to gather with your family. We need you to worship together. We need you to go through the resources we've given you. 
We need you to grow stronger so that when it's your time to reach your neighbor, you have a faith that can move a mountain. We're going to get out of this, and even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For God's rod and his staff, they comfort us. Let's let that comfort us today. Let me pray with you. Father God, thank you again for your power. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your love. God, I believe we can be the church through this time. And I believe we can come out of this with a whole generation looking to you. God, in everything we do, we want to bring you glory and honor. We know that you're in control of this. Help us to play our part. And help us not be so concerned about not going to church. Help us to be more concerned about being the church. In Jesus' name.
making us part of your weekend in the midst of everything going on. We're so glad that we could stay connected. Hope today's message encouraged you to find peace, to find rest, and ultimately to not fear in the midst of, of what's going on. This hasn't surprised God. God is um, not dethroned because of the coronavirus, but God um, is still with us. He's near, and he has something that he wants to show us through this. And so we hope that you'll step into that this week, that this week you'll do everything you can to prevent the spread of this uh, virus and of fear, that you will live uh, connected to the peace of God, and that this week that you would um, share that message, share that message of hope and, and peace uh, with your friends, with your neighbors, and, and when God asks us to step up, that we would step up and we'd be the church, a church full of love, a, a church full of, of peace and hope. Uh, we're so grateful once again. We hope that we can stay connected even this week. On Monday, uh, Pastor Alan Rogers will be delivering a message uh, from Celebrate Recovery. And uh, on Tuesday, Pastor Wayne will be de uh, developing and delivering a message about re-engage and how to stay connected in marriage. And this week, we want to provide every opportunity for your students and your child to be connected uh, as they feel anxious, as they understand that the world is a little bit different right now. We want to provide the resources necessary uh, to stay connected to the church and stay connected to what God has for each and every one of us. Once again, thanks for making this part of your weekend. We invite you to, to share this video, share this message with those who need to hear it. And we invite you to join us again on Monday as we continue to, to take your next step towards Christ so that we can be closer to him and be stronger because of this situation. We hope you have a great week. Stay, stay in peace. Stay in health. We love you guys. If you have any questions or need prayer, send us a message at info at theavenuechurch.com. We are always here for you. Looking for ways to give from where you are? Text the amount to 84321. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media to stay in the loop. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next week.